Well, good afternoon, um, everybody. Thank you for thank you for having me. Uh, thank you for having me. Thank you for joining us on, on this panel, particularly when there's so many other wonderful places you could be, um, other panels you could you could be hearing. Um, I've also changed job title since that went to press. I'm now a development officer. Um, as we heard, I'm from London Metropolitan Archives. So London Metropolitan Archives is the largest local government authority archive in the country. We hold the records for the City of London Corporation, but also the, um, the former Great London Council, uh, the London County Council, and various other sort of London-wide bodies, um, as well as his, um, hospitals, businesses, and various other community groups. And it's really in the context of our community collections that I have the privilege of addressing you um, this afternoon. Um, we live in very uh, changing and hopeful times when it comes to issues around LGBTQ, that is lesbian, um, gay, bisexual, uh, trans or transgender, queer plus lives. Um, in the last few years, there have been some um, very profound and hopeful changes. In uh, 2015, the um, United States Supreme Court ruled that um, um, bans on um, same-sex marriages would be unconstitutional. The Republic of Ireland became the first uh, country to instigate um, same-sex partnerships through uh, popular vote. And uh, interestingly, um, amidst the wreckage of his premiership, David Cameron was keen to salvage some good news. And the good, new the good news he, he chose to uh, find amongst the rubble was the uh, introduction of the marriage equality. So there's some very hopeful developments. Uh, there's also some very sobering realities when it comes to LGBTQ lives uh, globally. In 74 countries, there are laws um, uh, prohibiting um, so-called homosexual acts. Uh, in those countries, 13, uh, so 13 of those countries punish said acts um, with a death penalty. And within those countries, 17 uh, have laws against so-called homosexual propaganda. So there are some very hopeful developments. There are some very uh, sobering realities. And there's um, probably every shade of gray and nuance in, um, in between. Um, and as archives, it's our responsibility to chart those changes to record the memories and the, the, the life stories of the people that lived through them as also being a kind of an honest uh, resource for um, activism and to fight for future, um, future changes. I'm very much aware that there are two wonderful presentations um, to follow and that people come to events like this not only to be spoken to but to speak. So I'm going to do my very best to uh, keep not only to time but actually to come in slightly under time. So the best way I think to do that is for me to stick uh, very closely to the script, perhaps more closely to the script than I might, um, I might normally. So uh, I'd like to say, I'd like to tell you a bit more about uh, the Speak Out London Diversity City project, which we've been running um, at London Metropolitan Archives for the last two or so years. So uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, and queer, uh, um, queer plus people, LGBTQ plus people, have always been part of the fabric of London, yet their histories have been marginalised. Archives reflect this marginalisation with collections that often cast LGBTQ plus people as criminal, immoral, or ill. Speak Out London Diversity City, supported by the Heritage Lottery Funds, um, the HLF, our heritage funding stream, has started to directly address this marginalisation of this part of London's history. Since 2014, Speak Out volunteers, supported by London Metropolitan Archives, LMA, have created a community archive using oral histories and community records to complement and, where necessary, challenge more formal collections held at LMA. Over the last two years, we've interviewed over 50 people and digitised new and existing collections. Between May and August 2016, the new collections featured an LGBTQ plus history exhibition at LMA and are now accessible in our MediaTek and will soon be accessible online as well. Archival collections uh, reflect the prevailing attitudes and power structures of the societies that create them. LMA's collections date back to 1067, and for most of this period, LGBTQ plus people and their experiences have been marginalised. LGBTQ plus people have been variously depicted as criminal, ill or immoral, with prosecution, medical intervention and moral judgment the results. Official bodies records such as courts, hospitals and churches, which support and further these depictions, reliably make their way into archives, whilst accounts from the perspective of the marginalised do not. Consequently, historical record relating to LGBTQ plus lives is often not a record of the lives themselves, but of other people's judgments on those lives. And I have here on the slide for you just a very brief selection of, of um, records that illustrate that pattern. So our oldest document, um, which gives evidence of LGBTQ plus lives, um, a trial for so-called immorality dating back to 1395, um, a medical report about homosexuality uh, in women by Dr. Albert Winner, uh, so Albertine Winn, excuse me, 1947, and Homosexual and Prostitution uh, from 1955. 
Uh, there are, however, important and notable exceptions to this pattern in LMA's collection and in other archives across the country. In our collection, deposits from Peter Tatchell, Kenrick, Ruckus and others offer a community perspective on LGBTQ plus history. These collections show the wealth of potential material available to archives and challenge institutions to take an active and strategic role in their acquisition. Um, following on, I suppose, from what we heard about um, the keynote um, just now, the initial impetus of the Speak Out project was to record the oral histories of older members of the LGBTQ plus community. This generation's stories are often undocumented, and without action we will lose them as people become frail and pass away. The initial hope was to create a collection of oral histories that could grow over time. A successful HLF bid under the Our Heritage funding stream provided the funds not only to gather oral histories, but also to create a digital community archive and revisit existing collections. Since the project was addressing the marginalization of LGBTQ plus histories, it was essential that the Speak Out project had members of these communities at its core. This allowed um, LMA to listen to the needs of, the, of community members, especially those underrepresented in the collection, such as BME, transgender, and bisexual groups. By contributing to the project, community members were able to develop skills in many areas, including oral history interviewing, cataloging, archival research, events management, web design, as well as exhibition planning and production. Equipped with these skills, volunteers with support from LMA staff uh, embarked on the process of gathering oral histories, building a community archive, and visiting collections. And before I move on from this slide, I should stress that these are all facsimiles, so that's why we have pens and post-it notes on them. That's not how we treat our original documents at, um, at LMA. Um, these are some of our oral history participants. Oral history provides a way of reaching histories that are often inaccessible or overlooked by archival sources. The different approach offered by oral histories is valuable in a range of contexts, but especially so for LGBTQ plus histories. This is because for much of the... Uh, of history, the activities of LGBTQ plus people were taboo and in some cases illegal. As a consequence, central aspects of sexual, romantic and social relationships often do not exist on paper as to record them was to risk persecution and prosecution. Thus many of the usual archival documents that were used to understand people's lives are of limited use. Gathering oral histories allows people to speak about those very experiences that otherwise likely to go undocumented. For the Speak Out project, volunteers were trained in how to gather oral histories by experienced historian Claire Summerskill. Over 50 interviews were eventually conducted and transcribed over a two-year period starting in August 2014. We sought in these recordings uh, to capture the widest range of possible LGBTQ plus experiences possible. Stories vary from the personal to the political and the tragic to the comic and all things in between. They include accounts of cruising in post-war Leicester Square, older transgender people getting changed in cars before, before visiting a Fulham restaurant, the first meeting of the Gay Liberation Front at the London School of Economics, the setting up of the Lesbian and Gay Centre, the schisms within the women's movement and the devastation caused by the arrival, uh, the arrival of HIV AIDS in the 1980s. There's an international perspective on these stories too, with people uh, coming to London because of the, the relative uh, freedom that it offered in, in, um, in these regards. These oral histories that we have, have gathered not only record people speaking in their own voice against and about their marginalization, but also add new dimensions and nuances to our existing collections. Over the coming years, we will continue to grow this thriving collection so it can make a major contribution to British LGBTQ plus oral history. Although the archival uh, record for LGBTQ plus history is incomplete, it's not non-existent. Records of spaces, groups, and personal lives exist especially after 1967, which was um, a landmark, which, is the, which marked the partial decriminalization of, um, of homosexuality in um, UK and Wales. So in England and Wales, excuse me. Um, but there's a challenge with these records. And the challenge is that the forms these records take can be difficult for institutions to work with and for individuals to let go of. The clearest example of this is ephemera. So ephemera includes receipts, tickets, flyers, newsletters, and posters any item that was designed to serve a specific purpose and then be discarded after use. These items are hard to catalogue because they often stand alone and archive catalogues are arranged by the providence of items. More challenging is that ephemera often has emotional value to its owners. The items in question may be mementos of happy or important times and people are understandably reluctant to part with them. We met this challenge by inviting people to bring us any items in their personal collections relating to LGBTQ plus history to digitization sessions held at LMA. Once digitized, items were returned to their owners. 
These sessions were sometimes standalone, but more often took place in the background of Speak Out uh, and LMA LGBTQ plus events. This approach allowed digitized items to be grouped together as a single collection and meant that people did not have to part with valued items. In this way, we're able to add over 2,000 new items to our collection. Highlights include magazines such as Bi-Monthly, Anti-Claws 28 posters, and early gay liberation front materials. This digitization process also establishes a relationship and trust with people, which has led to more formal acquisitions, and we have more formal acquisitions planned for the future. One depositor, after working with the project, has um, deposited a personal collection which includes an excellent selection of London Pride photographs stretching back 20 years. These photographs are now one of the most comprehensive, actually they are the most comprehensive visual record of London Pride in LMA's holding. This digital archive that we've created also incorporates items from LMA's existing holdings. A full-time catalogue editor was employed for six months, um, and this catalogue editor compiled an exhaustive list of LGBTQ plus collections, which we also digitise, um, which also digitise, and this takes the Speak Out archive to now well over 30,000 items. Uh, this comprehensive list was also used to produce an updated information leaflet to inform readers about LGBTQ plus collections held at LMA. This process of revisiting the collection also provided an opportunity um, for catalogue descriptions to be reviewed and new descriptions to be added. This was necessary because the most reliable way to find many, re many records relating to LGBTQ plus lives was to use archaic and legal terms such as immorality, gross indecency or unnatural misdemeanours. Such terms are problematic because they are potentially offensive to readers and they are no longer in common use, so they require a degree of specialist knowledge in order to locate records. But the solution to this problem was not to remove these descriptions entirely, but rather to add a new level, a new level of descriptions to them. The archaic terms themselves are part of the historical record, and to remove them will be to destroy historical evidence. The new so we added a new level, and this new level of description includes more familiar tags, such as lesbian, gay, bisexual, and trans. Although such descriptions risk anachronism, as they may not have been used when the records were created, and the people that the, that the records are about um, will not, may not define themselves in, the, in those terms, the view was taken that inaccessibility was a greater evil than anachronism, and that readers' historical judgment could be trusted to place these terms in their proper context. Um, this new digital archive that we've created can be accessed in a variety of ways, so uh, including our, our LMA's MediaTek area. The MediaTek at LMA has both uh, a large screen and single screen terminals. This allows both groups and individuals to access uh, the archive on demand and without prior appointment. The contents is arranged so it's easily searchable, but it can also be browsed. This ability to easily browse the archive is, is an important way to improve accessibility, as it allows people with a general interest in the subject area a way in, without the need for a specific research agenda or specialist knowledge. In addition uh, to the MediaTek, the Speak, Off, the Speak Out archive will be made available online. Um, at the time of writing, uh, so at the time of writing this paper, a selection of all histories and digital archive is being, is being put on, and over the next five, we have uh, funding for five years of, of support, so it will continue to grow over that five-year five period, and we're hoping it will be a, um, a, virtuous, uh, a virtuous cycle of, of more people seeing the website, hearing about the project, and choosing to contribute either all histories or, or, or materials. Um, LMA has an exhibition space, uh, which we use to display and draw attention to our, to our collections. To celebrate and promote the Speak Out, um, Speak Out project, a four-month temporary exhibition was created using materials from this, new, uh, from this new collection and from our existing collections. As with all aspects of the project, the community was involved in all decisions, and they decided on the key message of the exhibition and its themes. They also wrote text and were consulted on design concept. The resulting exhibition was framed as a discussion between old and new collections and the archive and its users about themes that emerged from your histories, namely progress, place, relationships, health, and identity. Its aesthetic drew heavily from the colorful and often DIY character, character of the ephemera uh, we collected. And I'd like to just talk a little bit more about two of the themes that we, um, that we addressed there. The theme of identity was the most challenging to present in the exhibition. Much thought was given on how to offer a discussion of identity that was neither trite nor reduced people to stereotypes. Another factor to consider was the mixed audience the exhibition would attract, which included members of the LGBT plus communities, but also school groups and the readers that attend, attend the archive. 
we wanted to offer some basic definitions uh, to people not familiar with the LGBTQ plus acronym, whilst at the same time we we're aware of the contested and changing nature of the words people use to identify themselves. It was in the spirit of the exhibition and the project to make the archive a place that starts conversations rather than presenting conclusions. Uh, with these considerations in mind, we settled on the idea of a graffiti wall displaying posters defining the acronym LGBTQ+, and the words lesbian, gay, bisexual, uh, transgender, uh, queer, and the importance as well of the, of the plus symbol. Um, visitors were invited to use pens to offer new definitions, dispute existing definitions, and share anything else they, they wanted. By the end of the exhibition, the wall was covered with graffiti. Contribu con contributions included alternative acronyms, so quilt bag, uh, which is, let's see if I can remember this. So it's queer, unisex, uh, queer, undecided, intersex, lesbian, uh, trans or transgender, bisexual, asexual, and gay, as well as greetings from foreign visitors and an expression of surprise that after nearly four months there were no phallic symbols anywhere on the board. Uh, all of these, uh, all of these uh, comments and more have been recorded and themselves form part of the Speak Out, the Speak Out archive. And we did have a kind of pain debate amongst ourselves of whether to wipe it clean or not in the end. And we did actually wipe it clean at the end because after speaking to our, our conservator, it's very difficult to conserve something, something like this. So we actually, we did, took the photographs, uh, wiped it clean, but we're now hoping to use this as part of our events as a way to sort of start the conversation um, again. Um, we decided to sort of make a, a virtue out of necessity in that, in that regard. The other theme that I'd like to sort of quickly discuss is, is place. So um, this was a repeating theme that appeared in both our oral histories and the group discussions. Places are a focus for people's memories and experiences. The disappearances of many queer spaces as the result of gentrification is a source of much regret and activism in the LGBTQ plus community. This, uh, this need to display memories of place led naturally to the creation of an interactive element of the exhibition based around a London map. After several iterations, a simple design was settled on. The only geographical feature was the Thames, which was represented with fragments of text selected from the oral histories and arranged into a found poem. On this, uh, facsimiles of documents from the collection were attached with magnets. People were encouraged to bring their own ephemera and attach it to the map. Offerings included uh, tickets from the drag star uh, Jinx Monsoon's latest show, membership um, for a motorsports club, articles about famous venues alongside more poignant items relating to the Admiral Duncan um, um, pub bombing and the killing of Ian um, Bainham. People were also encouraged to attach small, pieces of, attach small pieces of paper to the wall which contained descriptions of their memories of places. People shared the locations of bars and clubs, some still existing, others closed, as well as memories of isolation and connections, physical, romantic and social, both fleeting and enduring um, uh, connections. The Speak Out exhibition closed in August 2016, and this marked the end of the first phase of the project. Looking to the future, Speak Out volunteers supported by London Metropolitan Ar Archives will continue to grow the Speak Out archive by gathering new oral histories and digitising community archives, and more of this material will be put online. As well as growing the archives, uh, we'll be working with groups who will be able to use LMA as a queer space in which they can collect, preserve, and explore their history. Thank you.